Great. Um, okay, welcome everyone uh, to today's guest lunch uh, seminar. Um, I'm very happy to have uh, uh, Denis Sergi from University of Exeter speaking today. Um, I'm actually going to have Michael Way, uh, who suggested uh, that he speak today, uh, present a little bit more about his background and his research interests. Uh, but before we, we do that, I, I did want to run over mm -hmm. some of the, um, the, uh, the way that we're going to be doing the seminar today. Uh, so as with with previous talks, uh, we're really going to be utilizing the uh, the chat function. So if you have a question, uh, either you can write that in the chat or you can uh, indicate that you have a question and, and I'll unmute you. Uh, we are recording this presentation, uh, so this should be uploaded um, within about a week or two. So if you have colleagues who wanted to come but couldn't make it, um, you can let them know. Um, so I, I think at this point, um, I'll pass it off to, to Mike. Um, and, uh, and, and he'll provide us uh, some, some, some more about uh, Dennis' background. Great, thank you, Clara. So uh, yeah, I just thought I would introduce Dennis a little bit. I, I've known Dennis for a few years and visited him at Exeter some years ago, and I work with his group in a planetary model into comparison project called TAI, which he'll probably touch on a bit during his talk. But uh, Dennis got a specialist degree in uh, meteorology I guess is what we would call a undergraduate at Moscow State University in meteorology, and then did his PhD in meteorology at, at uh, University of East Anglia. And now he's doing, uh, I believe he's still doing a postdoctoral research fellowship at Exeter with some many colleagues of mine, some of which are mentioned here on this slide, like Nathan and Ian and James. And, uh, and Neil, I guess, is still at Oxford, I guess, or has he moved over? To Exeter too. So, yeah, he um, he's finishing his PhD in Oxford, and he's actually moving back to Exeter. Okay, great. That's going to be yeah. a great group. Yeah. So take it away, Dennis, and thank you so much for offering to give this talk. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mike, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, this work is actually uh, currently under review in the uh, uh, Planetary Science Journal um, Thai Special Issue. So hopefully it will be um, out soon. But uh, today I will just present some of the highlights of, of this work uh, on the bistability of the atmospheric circulation uh, on, a, on TRAPPIST 1E. And I would also like to thank my colleagues without whom this work uh, wouldn't be possible. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions uh, as we go. So please put them in the chat or uh, ask them directly. Um, my questions for this uh, in this study are the following. So uh, when we do 3D model uh, simulations of, of an atmosphere of, of an exoplanet, sometimes we see that circulation can reside in different atmospheric uh, regimes. And so the question was, uh, what model parameters or conditions um, can tip the circulation into a different regime? Um, are initial conditions important at all? Um, how does this regime bifurcation or bistability happen on a planet like TRAPPIST-1e? And then is the amount of water in the upper atmosphere affected by this uh, regime bifurcation? And does it show in uh, observables, such as the transmission spectrum? And to answer this question, I will go through uh, several uh, parts of my, uh, of my talk. Uh, I will start by an overview of the uh, typical atmospheric circulation on a tightly locked exoplanet. I will show that in uh, 3D general circulation model uh, simulations of trapist one e we see uh, uh, robust um, regimes uh, residing in, in two different states, single jet and double jet regime. And I will then focus on the regime bifurcation during the GCM spin-up period and see and, and show how uh, this bifurcation happens. Um, and then I will finish by uh, talking about the impact on the transmission spectrum and the terminator asymmetry in the two regimes. So um, 
as many of you know, the compared to the atmospheric situation on Earth, uh, tidally locked rocky exoplanets are influenced uh, by several key factors. Uh, so first of all, uh, due to abundance of uh, M dwarf stars in the galaxy, uh, exoplanets are frequently found around M dwarf stars, and due, the, due to their a small size of these stars, um, the um, the planets to be uh, in a habitable zone, it, it, it uh, frequently orbits the star, uh, it, it needs to orbit the star quite closely, which uh, eventually causes the tidal locking, uh, which can be uh, thought of as a perpetual day and, and night side. And uh, also, despite the uh, close orbits, the rotation rate is actually often greater than the rotation rate of, uh, of that of Earth. So quite often we model uh, tidal locked exoplanets with a, a rotation period greater than 24 hours. Uh, and so this affects the atmospheric circulation very much, of course. And then, of course, we have, uh, we don't really know the atmospheric composition yet on this uh, on this planet, uh, but hopefully with JWSTM and future uh, telescopes, uh, this will become um, gradually resolved. So in the end, we end up with different atmospheric circulations. So this can be summarized uh, in this, uh, using these schematics, for example. So because the, um, the planet is likely to be tightly locked. The radiative forcing from its from the host star is stationary and is only asymmetric. And this is only asymmetric forcing that causes um, an overturning circulation, which uh, which is shown by blue uh, arrows in this diagram in the uh, bottom of the slide. Uh, so going from the substellar point where the uh, radiative forcing is largest. Uh, to towards antistellar point, uh, this this overtonic circulation. Uh, other parts of of this uh, of the global circulation on tidal vortex planets consists of um, station waves, which are caused by this persistent uh, vertical motion and associated divergence. Um, and these stationary waves also accelerate the zonal wind at the equator, producing atmospheric superrotation, um, or in other words, an excess of uh, angular momentum at the equator, or in other words, uh, the um, eastward um, positive zonal wind at the equator. And this superrotating equatorial jet can also shift and interact with the planetary scale waves uh, resulting in uh, various uh, resonant effects and so on. And there are some uh, similarities with the tropical circulation on Earth. Um, so on Earth, we know that the latent heat released by deep convection over the Pacific causes convergence in the lower troposphere and uh, divergence in the upper troposphere as um, for example, uh, shown by this uh, schematic from Valstal uh, 2020. And this pattern uh, is known as um, uh, Matsuno Gil, Gil uh, pattern, which is a, essentially a combination of uh, Rossby and Kelvin waves uh, at the equator. And in the upper troposphere, uh, this uh, pattern corresponds to a pair of anticyclonic Rossby chires. Uh, which are shown in, the, in this uh, figure at the top by the uh, um, H uh, letters. And also there is an equatorial wave, a Kelvin wave uh, to the east of, of the heating source. And meanwhile, on tightly locked uh, exoplanets, um, which as I said before, often have slow rotation rate, um, the Rossby deformation radius, which essentially defines the uh, this, this, the extent of this um, Matsuma-Gill pattern, uh, 
the Raspberry Pi the deformation radius is often comparable to the size of the planet. So this uh, equatorial pattern on Earth essentially extends over the whole planet uh, for a tightly locked um, uh, exoplanet case. Uh, but you can also note uh, if you compare this uh, simulation um, to the uh, situation on Earth that the phase of the waves is different because of, of the supertating jet, uh, because it, uh, the jet shifts the, the waves um, eastward. And so this kind of pattern is a typical pa uh, circulation pattern that has been found in many previous uh, 3D modeling studies, such as those shown in this slide. Um, and the um, typical features of, the, of this circulation regime are, uh, for example, um, cyclonic Rossby gyres uh, on the night side of a planet close to the western uh, terminator of the planet and the strong equatorial uh, supertating jet on the night side, which is kind of split or slowed down on the day side, forming this uh, sort of um, uh, these uh, lobes uh, on the day side, and then uh, which then merge back to the uh, equatorial jet on the, on the night side. Um, so um, this circulation regime has been characterized in many previous studies and um, is, has been also classified uh, as uh, type two regime by Nod et al. 2017, for example, or as uh, Ryan's rotator regime by Hackney et al. Um, 2018. Um, however, this, um, a lot of these previous studies focused on rather idealized or abstract uh, exoplanetary setups. Um, but to understand um, real exoplanets or confirmed terrestrial exoplanets better and to interpret future observations from JWST and other instruments, um, we need to simulate real uh, exoplanets and um, try to explain and understand the dynamics on, uh, in, in the atmospheres of confirmed exoplanets. One of the best um, candidate for future atmospheric characterization is um, TRAPPIST-1e, which is the fourth planet uh, in the TRAPPIST-1 system, uh, which actually was discovered five years ago. Uh, there was a, an anniversary uh, about two months ago, a uh, big celebration uh, of the discovery of this uh, system and this planet. And uh, TRAPPIST-1e, um, the whole the whole system, as you know, uh, is is very small because the host star is, is also very small and and cool, and so it, it kind of fits within the orbit of uh, Mercury when compared to our solar system. Uh, but because the um, of, because of the um, small size and, and low temperature of the host star, the habitable zone is also um, much closer to, to the star, and so it's aligned such that uh, TRAPPIST-1e fits uh, nicely uh, pretty much in the middle of the uh, conventionally uh, defined Trappist, uh, habitable zone. And of course, uh, TRAPPIST-1e was also uh, a strong contestant of the ExoCAP 2021. It reached the quarterfin quarterfinals, so uh, it's, a, it's a promising uh, exoplanet overall, I'd say. Um, and so, as Mike uh, mentioned at the beginning, we collaborate on the uh, on the first um, uh, exoplanet inter, uh, intercomparison project, which is called Chaps One Habitable Atmosphere Intercomparison or TIE. Uh, in this uh, project, uh, we compared four uh, 3D GCMs. XCAM, LMDG, Rocky 3D, and the UM for uh, four different cases uh, of the atmospheric composition uh, on TRAPPIST 1e. Two of them were uh, dry cases, uh, nitrogen or CO2 dominated, and, uh, and the, the uh, two other cases were moist, uh, which um, 
essentially were the same as uh, benchmark one and, and benchmark two, but with uh, water as a as the main condensable species. And so uh, you can find more details about this in the comparison, and, and the results are uh, written up as uh, in the Plantry Science Journal Special Issue, uh, currently under review. Um, but one of the key um, findings can be summarized using the zonal mean, zonal wind uh, vertical cross sections. So here I'm showing uh, these cross sections for, for example, for the one of the dry cases, benchmark one, a nitrogen dominated case for the four GCMs. And if you focus on the sort of uh, troposphere on the, on the lower uh, part of, of the atmosphere, roughly below 100 hectopascals, you can see that uh, there is a dichotomy of the atmospheric regime. In two of the models, uh, it is dominated by two, uh, by um, sort of uh, two mid-latitude uh, jets, while in uh, Rocky 3D and in BM, it is dominated by the um, depth circulation, circulation is dominated by the uh, super rotating, uh, strong super rotating jet at the equator, which uh, corresponds to the um, pattern I showed before. And what is interesting is that we find this uh, dichotomy throughout uh, the all the 16 simulations in this project and it doesn't stay consistent between models or between cases um, so this regime uh, dichotomy is essentially uh, it, it depends not only on the atmospheric uh, composition of on, for the planet but also on the GCM that you're using so that among other things that this also um, makes a strong case of using more than one GCM for modeling exoplanetary climates because uh, you can end up in, in, in a similar situation where uh, there is a um, regime by stability or, or bifurcation. Uh, what is also interesting is that we find, uh, looking, looking at the UM simulations, for example, uh, what, what, what I discovered is that the uh, regime, um, the circulation regime depends not only on the, on the case, um, on, on the atmospheric composition, and not only on the GCM, but also on the uh, parameterizations used, such as the uh, parameterization of convection. Um, so the question is then why um, why this happens on uh, a planet like TRAPPIST 1e. And um, as we uh, note in our, in our papers, um, TRAPPIST 1e lies on the, um, essentially on the, on the re regime boundary as defined by the um, uh, Rossby deformation radius. Um, and this, this can be summarized using this diagram from a paper by Karana et al. 2018, where on the x-axis you have the uh, orbital period in days, and the, on the y-axis uh, you have uh, planetary radius. And so uh, they uh, simulated um, various um, exoplanetary regimes uh, to, um, to map this um, parameter space. But if you focus on the TRAPPIST 1e, which is kind of, which is here, it pretty much lies on this uh, boundary between um, the regime characterized by super rotation and, uh, or high latitude jets, and sort of more familiar to us, weak super rotation, super rotation regime, um, which emerges in uh, sort of more slowly uh, rotating exoplanets. So to investigate this more, I, uh, in, in the present study, I'm focusing on just one of the cases, the habitable one case, which is a nitrogen dominated atmosphere with uh, 
moisture uh, and with, with water as, as a condensable species. And I uh, conduct a series of sensitivity experiments using the, uh, the HAB1 case, uh, identical to that used in the Thai project as the control or the, or the base um, simulation. And then uh, in sensitivity runs, I vary such parameters as the convection scheme. Um, I switch off uh, cloud radiative effects. I change the initial temperature, um, slab ocean depth, uh, surface temperature, and sort of the, the overall initial conditions. Um, and so uh, just, just, to, just to note here, uh, when I say I change the initial temperature, for example, uh, according to the Thai protocol, we initialize um, all uh, our GCMs with uh, an isothermal um, profile, uh, sort of so constant temperature throughout the atmosphere and constant temperature at the surface. Um, Hi, Dennis. Can was I? There a question? Yeah, can yeah. I just ask one question? Sorry, in the previous slide, I, I know you're not focusing on this. Um, yeah. But so just comparing the, um, the, the, I guess the third and the fourth rows, um, is mm -hmm. this the fourth row, am I right in understanding? So these kind of don't really have as clear a stratosphere. Are, are these, these don't have compositional forcings? What, what, how do you go from row three to four? Uh, so, um, so the, difference between HAB1 and HAB2 yes. is that HAB1 is nitrogen dominated, okay. while HAB2 is CO2 dominated. But ah, we okay. still assume that water is present in both cases and can form clouds and, and rain. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah, but, but because uh, HAB2 cases is much uh, warmer, uh, it kind of sort of expands uh, in height. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, uh, thanks um, for for the question, um, in terms of like the stratosphere, it's less well defined as uh, on Earth because we don't have ozone in these simulations, for example, and so uh, it, it's generally uh, weaker the, the tropopause. Yes. Uh, Thanks. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so here um, I can then uh, summarize the results of all these sensitivity runs by um, sort of characterizing their, their atmospheric circulation regimes in terms of the strength of uh, superitation, uh, which is shown here uh, at the, uh, as the maximum zonal wind at the equator in, in the upper uh, troposphere. Uh, and in, on the y-axis, I also I'm also plotting the latitude of the uh, tropospheric jet, essentially showing. Uh, where the uh, jet core is located, whether is uh, is it uh, close to the equator or is is it in uh, mid latitudes? And so, interestingly enough, um, all these sensitivity experiments uh, cluster nicely together into two groups. Um, one group, uh, sort of close to the base simulation, uh, is characterized by a single jet regime with strong superitation at the equator. Uh, and so you can see here that the uh, maximum zone wind is, is uh, relatively high and the uh, tropospheric jet is uh, maximum is, is close to the equator in, in, in low latitudes. While the other group is characterized by a weaker uh, eastward wind at the equator, uh, it's still technically super rotating, but it's, it's much weaker. And um, while the strongest jet um, allocated in mid latitudes, and so we call this regime a uh, double jet or DJ regime. Um, and so, um, because they uh, all these sensitivity experiments align so nicely, um, for the rest of my uh, talk, I will use uh, two of them as uh, two illustrative. Uh, illustrative cases, uh, namely, I will use uh, the base simulation for the uh, single jet regime and the uh, T280 
for the double jet regime. And what is interesting, again, to, to emphasize is that even uh, um, starting the simulation um, with such a small difference as the uh, initial temperature being 20 degrees colder, actually is able to tip the uh, atmospheric circulation into uh, a completely different uh, regime. Uh, so I will uh, try to explain this later, but for now I will just use this um, as two uh, sort of um, um, two, two cases to illustrate the point. And also um, because uh, the only difference between these two setups is the initial temperature, it uh, allows me to eliminate the influence of uh, for example, the effects of permutations or uh, cloud radiative effects uh, to, to compare them uh, uh, sort of uh, more cleanly in a way. So, so let's see how these two regimes look in the steady state uh, first. So um, I'm again showing the zone mean zone wind uh, here along with uh, contours of uh, temperature, uh, zonal mean uh, temperature for these two regimes. And then this is how they look uh, in terms of uh, longitude latitude uh, maps. So the single jet regime has this uh, sort of typical Ryan's or Sather uh, shape um, with uh, characteristic um, Rosby Gyres. Uh, in, in close to the western terminator and uh, strong uh, divergence uh, in the upper atmosphere at the substellar point while um, the double jet regime is sort of more zonally uh, symmetric and uh, is characterized by a stronger temperature gradient as, as can be seen in, in colors here and also uh, if you look at the um, isotherms uh, in the zonal cross-section. And uh, this uh, circulation uh, pattern is, has, this, has this shape essentially because of the, um, of the station wave pattern, which can be uh, shown by plotting the anomalies of the geopotential height. These are uh, uh, deviations from the zonal mean um, of the of the geopotential height at 300 uh, hectopascals again, and uh, also overlaid uh, by uh, eddy winds uh, at the same height. And you can see that in the single jet regime, the uh, pattern is much more pronounced, and the uh, the wave crest corresponding to the to this pair of uh, anticyclones. Is located in the eastern hemisphere of the planet to the east of the substellar point, which is at zero degrees. And this uh, position of the um, wave crest is, is marked by the uh, cyan line here. While in the DJ regime, uh, the anticyclones are, sh are sort of uh, shifted to the west uh, and are also much weaker and confined to higher latitudes. And so um, this pattern of, uh, is actually quite reminiscent of the simulations uh, using uh, shallow water models and essentially represents a superposition of stationary uh, equatorial Kelvin and Rosby waves as, uh, as nicely shown by Hammond and Pierre Humbert uh, in this plot. Um, and they can also be, uh, they, they essentially have the same structure as uh, equatorial Rosby and Kelvin waves uh, close to the equator on Earth, um, such as uh, here shown on the right by Kaladis et al. 2009. And there are plenty of other uh, studies uh, um, based on, on shallow water uh, equation modeling which essentially confirm uh, that um, 
this pattern merges in uh, in a single track regime. And uh, so then the, uh, in the next few slides, I will focus on the transition of the circulation regime in the early stages of, of the simulation in our model. And this, this is not uh, a new uh, work. It, it has been um, it, it has been applied to uh, earth climate, um, such as uh, in the work by Suarez and Duffy in uh, 1992, where they uh, found that there is a certain threshold of um, heating at the uh, equator, which makes the atmospheric circulation to transition from um, a sub-rotating to super-rotating state uh, in the in the equatorial troposphere, and then Arnold Dahl continued that work and uh, found this the, essentially the same happening in uh, uh, CAM simulations uh, for for an Earth-like uh, atmosphere, and they try to explain it. Uh, essentially, they proposed the explanation for this as uh, the wave jet resonance, uh, meaning that. Uh, the equatorial jet interacts with uh, station waves and uh, essentially they reinforce each other. Um, and then this, this was continued by Herbert et al, uh, where they, um, they were in their more idealized work, they found uh, some interesting uh, hysteresis uh, regime uh, for, for this sort of simulations. While for exoplanets, uh, similar studies have been uh, have been done, but mostly focusing on the uh, dependence on, of, of this um, circulation regimes with the uh, on the rotation period of the planet. And so they also, for example, Edson et al. found uh, hysteresis uh, with respect to the rotation period. And as I mentioned before, uh, Karan et al. Um, sort of uh, continued that work. I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have one question uh, in the chat from from Chris um, Pelosi. So sure. um, he asks: So these primarily have been slab ocean studies. So how might ocean dynamics influence hmm. the presence of these regime shifts? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question, Chris. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the uh, dynamical ocean would uh, probably change the results a lot because, and and as I said. Um, all our simulations uh, in, in Thai and in this study um, have been done with with either a slab ocean or a fixed SSD um, low, low boundary condition. And how, how it may change is uh, sort of warrants many more studies, I would say. But um, essentially, it might uh, introduce maybe another hysteresis effect and delay this transition um, or sort of dampen this transition uh, in the, you know, when, when compared to the atmosphere, atmosphere only um, simulations. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess I'll continue. Um, the key point here is that for exoplanets, there hasn't been much uh, focus on the um, early stages of our 3D GCM simulations. And certainly, even though uh, this regime transitions uh, were found for with respect to the rotation period, for a planet uh, with a fixed rotation period, such as TRAPPIST-1e, uh, we still find uh, the regime transition, even you know, um, all, the, all the planetary and stellar parameters being fixed. So, um, to understand how this, uh, how these two um, atmospheric regimes emerge, I'm focusing on the spin-up period. And first, I'm going to show you a movie where, on the um, uh, at the top, I'm showing the uh, geopotential height anomalies, uh, whose latitude, uh, whose longitude is tracked by this vertical fine line, uh, which uh, essentially uh, tracks it and then plots the uh, 
the, the curve um, at the bottom. Uh, so this is the longitude of the wave crest. And then on the uh, bottom uh, of, of this video, I'm showing the um, uh, zonal mean, zonal wind, and zonal mean uh, temperature contours as before. So as you can see, so on, on the left, oops, sorry. Uh, on the left, I'm showing the base, the control simulation corresponding to the uh, single jet regime. And on the right, uh, it's the uh, T0 280 simulation, which uh, is initialized with a 20 Kelvin colder uh, atmosphere. And so at first, you can see that actually uh, the simulation, the T280 simulation, develops the equatorial superposition faster, as uh, exemplified by this uh, brown uh, curve on, at the bottom. It kind of uh, um, accelerates faster uh, than that in the base regime. And here, the superposition jet is actually stronger by, by the day uh, around 50 days, for example. Um, but then what happens, it uh, essentially rather quickly splits into these two mid-latitude jets and the, the uh, eastward wind speed at the equator drops uh, down, while in the base uh, configuration, uh, the atmospheric circulation um, sort of is, is, is rather wobbly at the beginning but it remains um, uh, rather persistent and gradually develops this uh, superposition characterized by higher values of the zonal wind um, shown by the brown curve here and is able to uh, stay in this um, superposition state uh, throughout the simulation. And as you can see um, from the top, um, this also corresponds to a stronger wave, a stationary wave pattern, which uh, is able to grow and um, interact with the uh, superpotating jet, while on the right, the, the wave patterns are weaker and more transient in nature. And uh, on average, if we uh, do a time average of this um, of this picture, the uh, anticyclonic pair stays to the west of the of the uh, substellar point, which uh, which is shown by the longitude of the wave crest uh, staying in the negative values in this plot. And so, uh, so then. The, the question I had was, why, uh, why, why is the spin up different, even though the um, model setup is pretty much identical except for the initial temperature? And my current hypothesis is that uh, the biggest difference is introduced by the uh, moisture value va variables, namely by uh, water vapor. And the water vapor path or the integrated uh, specific humidity, uh, vertically integrated uh, water vapor is shown in this maps at the top. Uh, it's also a video. And you can see that uh, in the first um, 10 to 20 days of the simulation, there's a very large spike of uh, water vapor close to the substellar point. And I should say the uh, all the simulations uh, were initialized from a completely dry and cloudless state. So at the beginning, there's a very large spike. And then uh, throughout the spin up period, uh, the um, amount of water vapor reaches it, its sort of steady state conditions and becomes rather similar between the two regimes. But what matters is the amount of water vapor at the very beginning in the first, uh, as I said, 10 to 20 days. And 
this time, uh, time series on the left shows the um, day side average of the water vapor path in the two um, simulations. So blue shows the base regime, uh, the single jet regime, and the uh, team of 80 to 80 shows the um, sensitivity simulation. And you can see that the, the spike is, is uh, visible and uh, much higher in the base simulation. And so what, what happens then is that um, due to this spike of water vapor, the day side mean shortwave heating uh, due to absorption by water vapor is also higher in, uh, uh, in the base simulation. But also the long wave cooling uh, by water vapor is um, uh, stronger in the in the base simulation, and it actually offsets the short wave heating. And so, uh, while other sources of uh, heating rates, uh, such as that by uh, due to the convection, are roughly similar and also smaller in magnitude compared to the uh, radiative heating. And so if we add all the diabatic sources of heating together, we found that um, due to this cooling offset, the uh, sum of, of the heating for the base simulation is actually weaker than uh, for the sensitivity case. And uh, this results in a weaker forcing of the atmospheric circulation, weaker response in the station waves and uh, it means that um, the superrotation is able to emerge faster in the sensitivity case, but then uh, it, it kind of dies down or, or sort of, as I, as I showed before, it, it splits into the, into the two mid-latitude jets instead, while in the base simulation, it emerges slower, more gradually, and, and sort of stays um, in a, in a classic superrotating state. And so this sort of arguments can be qualitatively uh, compared to uh, some previous studies such as uh, that by Pierre Hambert and Hammond, where they compared uh, simulations with uh, uh, sort of cold and, and temperate conditions corresponding to a, a weak and strong um, stellar forcing uh, with completely different magnitudes uh, compared to us, but qualitatively, there's also some uh, similarity between um, uh, the two uh, regimes here. Uh, so, as I showed before, uh, this is what the spin-up for these two regimes looks like in terms of the position of the station waves uh, in the single jet regime. Uh, it emerges more gradually and, and stay and uh, the, the wave crest uh, stays in the eastern hemisphere in the positive values of the longitude, while in the DJ regime uh, it remains negative, although also with a larger uh, amplitude uh, showing the uh, transient nature of, of, of these waves. Uh, and this is the uh, um, eastward wind, maximum eastward wind at the equator, which aligns quite nicely with the uh, position of, of the um, um, station waves. Uh, and it also aligns nicely with this uh, purple curves shown at the bottom, which show the wave amplitude. So essentially, in the single jet regime, the waves are much stronger than in the TJ regime. And so what we see here by looking at these uh, pictures is that uh, this essentially represents the uh, wave jet resonance in the SJ uh, regime. And this can be also uh, shown by comparing the uh, eastward wind at the equator, shown here uh, by the... Um, so this is the vertical profile of the eastward wind uh, in the base uh, or single jet regime. And you can see that it, it kind of reaches the, this vertical 
blue line, which corresponds to uh, an estimate uh, of the uh, Rossby wave uh, phase speed, which uh, is, a, is, another, is, a, is another sign of the wave jet resonance, uh, according to, uh, at least according to the shallow water equation uh, theory. While in the DJ regime, the, uh, this uh, resonance doesn't happen because the, the jet is, isn't able to reach um, the wave speed of, uh, of the Rossby wave. Uh, and so more discussion on this can be found in my paper along with the angular momentum budget uh, discussion. Uh, but I will, uh, I will finish uh, my talk uh, by looking at the uh, impact on the observables. And uh, to begin with, um, this, these are the thermodynamic conditions, uh, again, in the steady state for these two regimes. This is the surface temperature and uh, near surface winds. And you can see that there are quite large differences in terms of surface temperature um, between these two regimes, especially uh, due to the uh, this so-called cold traps or uh, uh, Rossby Gyres regions uh, on the on the night side. Um, and overall, you can see that the single jet regime is more uh, longitudinally uh, horizontally asymmetric compared to the uh, DJ regime, and this uh, also corresponds to the um, this particular patterns of uh, water vapor. Uh, this shows again the water vapor path in the steady state. Uh, you can see that in the SJ regime is it's more uh, the, the the water vapor as well as clouds um, is more. Uh, meridionally spread out, while in the DJ regime is more uh, zonally symmetric. And this has an impact on the uh, transmission spectrum. And so here uh, I'm showing the terminator mean, so the average between uh, eastern and western terminators for the two uh, regimes uh, of the transmission spectrum. First, um, the SJ regime, uh, and so this plot shows the parts per million, um, uh, the transmission spectrum in, in, uh, in parts per million between 0.6 and 20 uh, micrometers. And you can see the characteristics, uh, characteristic uh, absorption features of uh, uh, the gases that we have in our simulation, such as uh, CO2 and water vapor. And Overlaid now is the uh, transmission spectrum for the DJ regime. And you can immediately see that the differences uh, are not that big. Um, and to look at them in more detail, we can just plot the difference between these two spectra, um, So, which is shown at the bottom. So this is the DJ regime spectrum minus SJ regime. And first of all, looking at the sort of um, overall difference, you can see that in the um, continuum level, um, the DJ regime uh, has a higher continuum uh, due to higher uh, amount of clouds at the terminators. But you can also see that the, there are significant dips um, corresponding to the absorption features of water. And uh, for example, here uh, at the 6.3 uh, micrometer uh, region, we can see that the SJ regime has the um, absorption feature stronger than that in the DJ regime because um, the uh, amount of water vapor in the upper atmosphere is higher, and this is shown by these uh, time mean vertical profiles at the terminators. So first of all, um, SJ regime at the western terminator in terms of, so here I'm showing the uh, air temperature, uh, specific humidity, uh, and then uh, cloud mixing ratio for liquid and ice clouds. And then, so 
compared to the DJ regime uh, at the Western Terminator and at the Eastern Terminator showing uh, shown by uh, the dashed lines. And so, as I said before, there is a dip at the uh, water absorption feature. And this, this can be explained by a much higher water vapor concentration uh, in the uh, SJ regime in the upper layers of the atmosphere, as shown in this specific humidity plot. And so, uh, which is interesting because um, this difference is not due to a convective polarization or something else, but just due to the uh, due, due to a different uh, uh, atmospheric circulation regime. And there are also some uh, noticeable differences in the clouds, which result in uh, in the differences in the um, continuum level in the spectrum. And there are also some uh, differences between the east and west terminators for each of the regimes. So now here I'm showing the uh, the spectra for the uh, SJ and DJ regimes separately. First, um, so um, in terms of uh, so first I'm showing the uh, cloudy spectra, which is uh, take it, which takes into account uh, all the absorption. Um, in the atmosphere, including clouds, um, and uh, looking uh, just at, at this spectrum, you can see that. Um, um, so, oh yeah, um, I forgot to mention that this is the uh, this. Now I'm showing the difference between eastern and western terminators. So eastern minus western, and. Uh, looking just at the uh, y-axis on this plot, you can see that the SJ regime has a bigger symmetry than the DJ regime. So theoretically, if this difference was observable, was was uh, big enough, uh, we um, it, it it would be theoretically possible to um, uh, maybe distinguish between these two regimes from observations. But of course, the absolute magnitude of these differences is below the noise level of uh, near-spec instrument of, on JWST, for example. So we probably need to, to wait for uh, the next generation of uh, instruments to, be, uh, to make it observable. Um, and also, if we then look at the clear sky spectrum, which is shown by this uh, cyan lines, uh, we can deduce that uh, most of symmetry is uh, actually due to water vapor at, at its absorption bands, like, like these peaks, and uh, most of all, the uh, peak near 6.3 micrometers. Um, and the continuum level difference, uh, which, which is the difference between these two curves, is rather small. It's on the order of uh, 0.25 ppm. Uh, and it also shows that the eastern terminator is, is cloudier. And the temperature contribution to the differences between the eastern and western terminators is the smallest and is only um, visible in CO2 bands and also somewhat in the Rayleigh slope uh, in the spectrum. Um, sim a similar uh, work has been done by uh, Song and Yang last year where they run a, a simulation similar to TRAPPIST-1E but using uh, Exocam and we found that the differences in the UM that I just showed uh, that, that, that I just showed to you um, are actually much smaller in magnitude than those found by Song and Yang and this is probably because um, uh, Exocam is um, known to uh, at least the version they used is likely to uh, to be much more cloudier than the UM, which we showed uh, in uh, in the time to comparison. Uh, so this again um, uh, advocates for more uh, intermodal comparison studies and using multiple models uh, to investigate this uh, regime bifurcation and regime by stability. So all in all, the take home messages uh, from the study are the following. So many 
for, for, for a TRAPPIST 1E like uh, atmospheric uh, circulation, uh, various model parameters in the GCM can tip the circulation regime uh, into different states. And this includes the convection scheme, the cloud radiative properties, as well as the uh, surface temperature, which uh, I briefly mentioned at the beginning. And surprisingly enough, the initial temperature, the initial conditions are also important, um, and uh, they even depend on the uh, initial isothermal uh, profile. And so, and this regime bifurcation in the early stages of the uh, GCM simulation happens on TRAPS-20 due to uh, different strength of the diabatic uh, heating uh, on the day side and then the resulting um, wave jet interaction uh, and wave jet resonance. And uh, what is also interesting is that the amount of water vapor in the upper, uh, upper atmosphere is affected and is uh, shown persistently, uh, sh sh shows persistently in the uh, transmission spectrum. So even for uh, simulations with the same convection scheme. Uh, and the uh, differences between these two simulations in terms of transmission spectra are rather small and not below the j uh, noise level, but hopefully uh, can be observable with the next generation of uh, telescopes or at least serve as a guidance um, for interpreting observations. Uh, and these differences are mostly due to water vapor, especially at this 6.3 micrometer band and clouds at the continuum level. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dennis. That, that was a really wonderful um, presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the, from the audience? You can either ask them directly or put them in the chat. I guess as we're waiting for that, um, I mean, I, I, I can just uh, make a somewhat naive comment as someone Mm -hmm. He's mainly kind of Earth. Um, I guess it's uh, it's it's pretty neat. Um, I guess I'm thinking about parallels with Earth, and and I guess there is some suggestion that with some of the kind of higher CO2 integrations uh, with with Earth, super rotation has has at least been achieved in some models um, through kind of an amplification of the MJO type circulation, and then that kind of changes how waves propagate out. Of the tropics, and then that affects kind of the, the latitude of the the momentum flux convergence. So you you end up getting it at the equator. Um, is is that kind of a mechanism? Is that kind of similar in spirit to to what you were talking about with the? I guess that would be your foot your first bullet one, where I I don't think you explicitly kind of mentioned the momentum fluxes. You talked about the amplitude of the waves, but but is that kind of your uh, idea yeah. there? Uh, yeah, essentially, it, it also can be thought of as uh, it, it can be approached from the perspective of momentum budget and uh, sort of looking at the at the moment of fluxes. And in fact, I uh, do that in the in the paper, but uh, just not here. Um, so. And essentially, there is a sort of competition between uh, this eddy moment of fluxes, which are driven by the stationary waves and they uh, pump the uh, eastern momentum towards the equator um, uh, versus uh, sort of a mean overturning circulation, which sort of uh, drives the momentum back to the uh, higher latitudes. And, and this competition seems to be uh, sensitive to, to the factors that I mentioned. Uh, and uh, essentially to the um, differences in, uh, for example, radiative transfer between the models, and they, that likely causes the, um, um, the different response in this eddy momentum flux, uh, which, then, um, try, uh, which then is able to, or, or, or not able to uh, accelerate the uh, control jet sufficiently. So, uh, yes, you're, essentially, you're right. 
Great, thanks. Um, do we have any more questions? Yeah, maybe I could just ask about the convection scheme. I guess, Dennis, you're referring to the difference in the type intercomparison with the convective adjustment scheme from LMD versus the mass flux schemes and the other three GCMs, yeah. right? So, I, yeah, so nobody here would be surprised that there will be differences there. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. Uh, so we we, uh, we know that uh, convection schemes, different convection schemes can result in different heating rates, heating rate profiles, um, where the convection is most vigorous. And for these planets, it's uh, at the substellar point uh, or around it. And uh, so what is interesting is that um, in the in the time to comparison, for example, we saw these differences between the models, and um, among these models, only LMD G uses the simple convective adjustment scheme, while others use the mass flux scheme. But um, nevertheless, there is, I mean, it, it doesn't stay consistent in, in one regime, for example, uh, and other regimes also sort of uh, flip between um, between the models. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I think more investigation into how the convection scheme affect this uh, regime by stability is needed. And also, um, in, in addition to that, um, analyzing the Thai data, our hypothesis was um, that it's the convection scheme primarily that is driving the uh, amount of water vapor in the um, upper atmosphere and then affect, affecting the uh, transmission spectra. But actually, as I showed uh, at the end of my talk, even for the same model configuration, for the same parameterizations, just because of the different atmospheric circulation regime, uh, the amount of water vapor can be changed. Uh, probably to the same to the same level. Um, so uh, trappist one e is, is a very tricky planet, it, it, it appears, um, at least at least for this sort of Earth-like conditions. And, uh, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, for a for slab ocean um, mm -hmm. setup. So, uh, yeah. Dennis, I had one, one question too. Can you hear me? Yeah, sorry. Um, a little, little sick. I can't talk well. But uh, so th th these, of course, since the planet orbits such a red star that is so absorbing in the short wave, how much? It's it's surprising that convection would be that prevalent. Uh, it, I wonder if you even did like these runs with no convection scheme turned on. Uh, how much that that would matter? Yeah. So actually, in my previous paper. Uh, in uh, AppJ, I uh, did some synthetic experiments where I changed the uh, convection scheme to an adjustment scheme and then also switched it off completely for Trappist 1E. And um, I found that essentially without the convection scheme, the circulation regime was similar to that uh, with the adjustment scheme for Trappist 1E. Um, but there were still some differences uh, in terms of surface temperature. So, um, I mean, the, the, convection is, the, the convection is still important even for a planet orbiting a cooler star. And we see that, I mean, the, the, convection, the, the convection still happens and the convection scheme is sort of persistently being triggered um, sort of in the center of the day side. And, uh, um, in a nutshell, I think it is important, but some GCMs are likely to overestimate its importance. And this is where the uh, explicit convection, high resolution modeling comes into place. And uh, we, um, we need to, to basically validate our uh, 3D GCMs with parameterized convection using high resolution models, uh, because obviously we don't have anything uh, better like in situ observations. 
Um, so yeah, I hope that sort of answers Thanks. your question. Yeah, I was just thinking of like Yuko Fuji's work, for example, showing how like a lot mm. of the water vapor lofting in the upper atmosphere is due to essentially radiation rather than uh, convection, which isn't too important on Earth because the atmosphere is so transparent at at the blue wavelengths of the sun. <laughs> right. No, yeah, I mean, radiation is uh, paramount, uh, is of paramount importance here, of course, but uh, yeah, I mean, convection scheme is able to, for example, flip the circulation regime. Um, so I would say it is important, at least for Trappist 20. Great, thank you. Um, so we're about 10 minutes past the hour. Um, so I think that maybe we can conclude for now. Um, I, mm -hmm. I really want to thank you for such an interesting uh, presentation and to Michael for uh, suggesting uh, that you that you speak as part of the seminar series. This, this really was great. Um, I'm just going to remind everyone that this was recorded. Um, so that should be posted um, in about one to two weeks. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, and I will send an ad thank for you. the next seminar. So thanks so much. Thanks, Clara. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Dennis. Thanks, Clara. Yep. Thanks, Dennis. Bye-bye.